Hello, I'm David Ruzik, Illinois Energy Prop. And today, I'm here to tell you about the future of lithium ion batteries. But let's start with one you're even more familiar with, the typical double or triple A. What's in it? Well, all right, let's see what's inside a battery. All right, well, that turned into a terrible mess. Uh, all you see is black, smudgy stuff. So uh, the diagram would be better. So here we have a double A battery. And yes, there's a lot of black things inside. But if I just kind of draw it up for you here, right, you got your plus terminal up here on the top. And it looks like there's a wire that comes through here. And then there's this separator, OK? Something that keeps the material from the anode from the material from the cathode. And these are called alkaline batteries because in here there's an electrolyte, potassium hydroxide, okay? And that potassium hydroxide is not an acid. In your car, that's a lead acid battery, and the electrolyte is hydrochloric acid. So this is why it's called an alkaline battery. Now what about that black material, am I right? Well, the anode, this part in here, is a zinc powder. And the stuff out here, the stuff that's the cathode, well, this is manganese oxide. All right, so what happens? Well, a battery is something that changes, okay? chemical energy to electricity. And what happens is for a reaction to take place, okay, for this zinc to become zinc oxide, I have to have electrons flowing. I have to have the current go from here to here, okay? I have to move electrons. And of course, if the battery is not connected to anything, then nothing happens. But if the battery is connected to something, say this is going to, you know, light up a light bulb along the way, all right, that electrons flow and those reactions can happen. So unless the electrons leave, nothing happens with the battery. Now, this turns zinc to zinc oxide in one case. But at this other electrode, this manganese oxide becomes a different version of manganese oxide, a more stable one, MnO3. Zinc turns to zinc oxide, manganese oxide turns to a more stable form of manganese oxide. Again, only when the battery is connected. But of course, eventually, the battery is dead. And when all the zinc is gone and turned into zinc oxide, and when all this manganese oxide is gone and turns into this form, the battery is dead. Of course, the batteries you really care about are the rechargeable ones, like in your cell phone, like this one, or in your electric car. And these are the lithium ion batteries. But the setup is pretty similar. All right, it's a little different in that, let's say this is the battery part here, okay? And we put a separator this way, kind of makes more sense. And on one side, we have some type of material that can bind with lithium. But let's take the last one. It could have manganese or iron or phosphorus or copper or aluminum, right? Or cobalt. We'll do this one. And then over here is just carbon, okay? Um, and let's say we start here with lithium carbon-6. We have some matrix of carbon or maybe silicon. Now what happens is a little bit different, okay? When I want to discharge this battery, not only do I get uh, electrons, 
ones, right, that have to go this way. I've connected this to a wire, right? I've got the electrons going, just like if you connected any other battery to something. But also, I have lithium ions move from here over to here, right? And this reaction, okay, this reaction takes the cobalt oxide to lithium cobalt oxide, and here we're left just with the carbon. So the lithium ions move as do the electrons. If I want this battery to then charge, I do this in reverse. So discharging the cobalt plus the lithium becomes lithium cobalt oxide or many one other of a many different materials. Okay? And the lithium on the other side leaves the carbon, leaving the carbon behind. If I want to go to charging it, I reverse this. I don't let the electrons flow like they want to. I actually have to plug it into the wall and push them this way. This then pushes the lithium back here, turning the carbon back to lithium carbonate and taking the lithium cobalt oxide back here. And this battery can go back and forth and back and forth. They're rechargeable lithium ion battery because the lithium ions move from side to side. Now, why doesn't this last forever? All right, it would be wonderful it does, but we all know that even our rechargeable batteries or our cell phone batteries or our batteries in our cars only have some limited number of cycles. Well, one thing is that the anode and cathode material can get corrupted. It can get contaminated and not be in this form where it easily can give up the lithium ion. Also, deposits could happen in places where the electricity is supposed to connect, therefore ruining the conductivity. And remember this membrane that keeps these two materials separate? It can fail or start to corrode or start to make it so it's much harder for the lithium to get through. All of these things could go wrong. But remarkably, they don't go all that wrong. The Tesla battery, the one that powers the Tesla cars of today, they call it a 2170 because it's 21 millimeters wide and 70 millimeters tall. For us Americans, that's about an inch by three inch, okay? And it can pack 260 watt hours per unit weight, per kilogram. A watt hour means I could run a 260 watt light bulb for one hour. It's a matter, it's a measure of energy. And these batteries are very capable. You can charge and discharge them. You can do this reversible cycle 15 hundred times. And you might say, wow, I charge the car every day, that's only three years, or five years, okay? No, it's more than that, because you don't totally charge and discharge it every day. If you figure out how many miles that is, that's 300,000 miles, and believe me, I've never had an internal combustion engine that's lasted anywhere near 300,000 miles. So that's pretty darn good, right? But what could be better? Well, there is a type of lithium ion battery that could be better, and that's the lithium sulfur battery, lithium S. And it potentially has double or even more energy storage. So you might say, this is wonderful, let's use it, okay? And, and what would it look like? Well, okay, we still have a battery here, all right? And we still have a separator. And on this side, we just have lithium. And on this side, we just have sulfur. Now, when you charge the battery, lithium 
ions go this way. Right? And they all go over here. And then when you discharge the battery, the lithium ions go back. A simple materials system that has this potential of having more energy storage. The problem with a lithium sulfur battery has been the number of cycles. You see that this sulfur here sometimes comes on for the ride. Okay? It comes with the lithium ions that are going across and then some of it stays behind. And this can come in a number of different sulfur complexes, but it's enough to worry about that sulfur. It's called the polysulfide shuttle. And when enough of this sulfur has come over here, just like other batteries, our chemical ones, when their chemistry is no longer pure, it's used up and its cycles are limited. So, what can we do about it? How can you solve these degradation issues? Well, one is you need something less reactive. All right? So maybe we can put in a more inert material around the electrodes, right? Because things around the electrodes mean you won't end up with the corrosion and those types of issues. What else you need is you need to do something to stop this sulfur from migrating. Maybe we can put some kind of cage, some kind of system around the sulfur so that the sulfur doesn't move across. So we beat the polysulfide shuffle. And finally, this separator, which is typically made out of some type of hydrocarbon, some kind of plastic. Can we make a better, purer, um, less degrading separator? And the answer to all of these is a simple but important space age material, and that's graphene. Graphene is six carbons all in a plane, okay? And these can make single sheets of atoms. And these carbons, each carbon has, you know, um, these more bonds, four bonds to it, and they continue going onward, and this carbon goes on to make an entire sheet. And if you can do the graphene right, you might be able to accomplish these goals to stop the degradation. And there's a company that does that, Lighten, all right? They make a special 3D graphene, right? Only they know how to make it. And to develop a better battery, like their website says, they have to make a better material. And they actually even have pictures of it. There you see individual atom-thick sheets of graphene. Now, I know about this company because my students and I work with them. They're based in San Jose, but we work on research with them to help try to create this graphene. So you might say, okay, that's great, Professor Ruzik, but you know, how good? How good really is this? Well, Lighten has claimed they will achieve three times the watt, conventional watt hour storage, right? And that means it's at least 600 watt hours per kilogram. And remember, the Tesla was 260 watt hours per kilogram. So more than double, at a minimum. And they've tested it for 1,400 cycles. This polysulfide shuffle has been eliminated by the addition all in here of the graphene. So this is a dramatic improvement. But there's a additional really good things too, all right? This will be cheaper because it doesn't use metals like manganese or cobalt. It's sustainable. You might say, well, you have to get sulfur. Well, remember, we not get away from sulfur, folks. Remember those coal power plants, sulfur dioxide? There is sulfur, lots of it, even laying around in waste pits, right? Tons of sulfur, don't worry about that. And the nice thing is 
it's laying around the United States. Okay? We don't have to import these rare earths or other difficult to find or pricey metals from other places outside our borders. So a better battery makes a big difference. How big? It can change everything. I mean, everything. Right now, you say, oh, my car can go, you know, 300 miles. How would you like it to go 800? Or maybe 300 is long enough and you can just have, have um, a half to a third of the batteries in it, right? That would be wonderful. Or if we've now put enough energy storage in something lightweight enough, can we put this in small planes? Maybe not the planes that go across oceans, but for other things. And what I think one of the really great potential advantages would be the big 18-wheeler trucks. Right now, they need so much energy, you'd have to charge them too often. But if you could have these types of batteries with two, three times as much energy density, we could change trucking. A better battery changes everything. And that's what you need to know about the future of lithium-ion batteries.